Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into DockerCon, and even bigger thank you for coming to my presentation. My name is Curtis Kapsack, and I'm a bioinformatics scientist working at Theogen Genomics. I'm a longtime member of the Staff B working group, and I'll explain what that is in just a moment. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you about how containerization has been the silent hero of the COVID-19 variant surveillance effort. I want to give a small disclaimer here and say that these slides and presentation were originally created by my colleague, Del Dr. Kelsey Florek, and then I've made some minor edits to them. So to help this set the stage, I wanna give a brief description of the field of bioinformatics. And so reading straight off of Wikipedia, bioinformatics is an interdisciplinary field that develops methods and software for understanding biological data. It combines principles from computer science, statistics, and most importantly, biology to help answer complex questions. In the context of public health, we are concerned with answering questions about the evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the cause of the human disease known as COVID-19. But answering these questions with bioinformatics requires compute infrastructure and technical expertise to implement uh, successfully in a public health setting. So there are a number of barriers that prevent the application of bioinformatics techniques in public health laboratories across the US as well as across the world. The first being that there is a vast landscape of compute infrastructure varying from on-premise servers to laboratories who have access to high performance compute clusters or access to public cloud or those with simply no infrastructure to work with at all. With this in mind, it's a serious challenge to bring in data analytics and bioinformatics. And additionally, many laboratories have limited experience working with open source software. Many of these laboratories also only have your typical IT support with desktop computers or network support, meaning that these labs have very little support when tasked with analyzing complex biological data that requires advanced computing and analysis. So that's where Staff B comes in. Staff B stands for the State Public Health Bioinformatics Working Group. And this group was formed with the goal of building resources and providing trainings to benefit all people working in the field. When you have scientists located all over the country working on the same topic, for example, COVID-19, it only makes sense to work together to benefit one another, and as a result, work synergistically towards the main goal of public health, which is, as you may have guessed, to improve the health of the public. So, Staff B works, uh, the Staff B Working Group supports the construction and maintenance of bioinformatics infrastructure in state public health laboratories, and a Staff B additionally partners with the Center for Disease Control, Centers for Disease Control, CDC, and APHL, or the Association of Public Health Laboratories, to help accomplish these shared goals. So with these barriers to bioinformatics in mind and the shared goals of public health labs, uh, this brings us to where Docker comes in. So several years ago, myself and Dr. Kelsey Florek started a project called Docker Builds. And the idea is to take commonly used and critically important bioinformatics tools and create a collection of Docker images that are easily accessible, well-documented, and developed in a way that makes sense for public health laboratories to use. Uh, the repository is a collection over a of, over, of over 100 different open source bioinformatics analysis tools that we've containerized. And these tools accomplish various tasks from uh, data quality control, to genome assembly, to annotation of these genomes, and classification as well. These Docker files are hosted on GitHub, and the Docker images are hosted on Docker Hub, freely available for anyone to use. So hopefully that paints the high-level picture of this project and how it fits into the context of public health. And now I want to focus on the idea of coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 variant surveillance because that is one idea area where we have seen a huge benefit to containerization and the usage of a lot of the tools that we use in the US and global surveillance effort. So briefly, I'd like to outline the process on how the data is generated. Imagine you're sick and you go to a COVID testing center. They swab your nose and let's just say, for example, you test positive for COVID. That swab might then be sent to a public health lab for the process shown on the screen. Uh, first, genomic material being either RNA or DNA is extracted from the swab and the SARS-CoV-2 viral DNA is then fragmented and then sequenced. 
DNA is made of A's, T's, C's, and G's. So we're essentially reading all of these A's, T's, C's, and G's of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. These reads are then assembled into their normal state and scientists then use a variety of tools to learn about the virus, learn about how it's evolved, how it's related to other viruses. The list of application goes on, applications goes on and on. Uh, crucially, the final piece is that the DNA sequence of the virus is then shared publicly so that it can be studied on a more national or global scale. This data can then be used to track the virus over the course of the pandemic and can be used to inform treatments for COVID and could potentially be used to develop more effective vaccines against COVID. So next, I'd like to highlight a couple of workflows that leverage these Docker containers. And the first one being uh, uh, called Secret, which uh, was developed by Dr. Aaron Young at the Utah Public Health Laboratory. And it's named Secret after the Secret Lake in Utah. As you can see, this is a fairly complex workflow that has many steps involved and is used primarily for analyzing SARS-CoV-2 genome sequence data. One thing to point out here in this workflow and other bioinformatics workflows is that Docker is utilized a little bit differently than how they are typically uh, utilized. A lot of folks use Docker containers uh, as a service and these containers are running all the time, let's just say for a website or for an app or something like that. And whereas in this context, Docker containers are spun up quickly, used for one or a couple of tasks, and then quickly destroyed for each of the steps shown here on the screen uh, in the bioinformatics workflow. Each tool in the workflow has a specific set of dependencies, and so containers obviously help isolate these processes and allow us to run a variety of tools on the data. Another set of workflows that I'm biased towards is developed by my colleagues at Theogen Genomics called the Public Health Viral Genomics Workflows. These are workflows used for analyzing SARS-CoV-2 DNA sequence data, much like the secret workflow. One of the benefits to these workflows is that they can be run in the cloud and can be operated through a GUI interface that is friendly and accessible to scientists at these public health laboratories. No command line experience or in-house compute infrastructure is required with these workflows. So essentially these laboratories can leverage these containerized workflows and perform the COVID surveillance work that has been important to carry out during the pandemic. And I should mention that these, this, these workflows were developed by Kevin Libwit, Dr. Robert Petit III, and Frank Ambrosio. So to illustrate how impactful these Docker images have been, we've kept our eyes on the number of pools or downloads from Docker Hub. And in March of 2021, we noticed an increase in the number of pools from some of the Docker images, most notably the ones typically associated with coronavirus surveillance. At the time, I was excited to see upwards of 100 plus pools, let alone 1,000 pools. So this was very fulfilling and exciting to see people using our library of Docker images. And now, over a, a year later, more labs have brought on coronavirus surveillance and have started using these Docker images much more frequently. So as of April of 2022, these, some of the Docker images have, have received over a million pools which really illustrates uh, how much of an impact they have had on the field. And it's very exciting to see the Docker container technology implemented in this area. Uh, I'll just pause for a brief moment. I, I always look at this slide in awe of, of, of the number of pools. So I, I, it's very exciting for myself. Um, so next I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about the coronavirus itself, the evolution and how we're tracking the virus over time. So SARS-CoV-2 mutates at a rate of around two mutations per month in the entirety of its approximately 30,000 base pair genome. And so what we're looking at now is a phylogenetic tree, which illustrates the genetic related relation, relationships between SARS-CoV-2 genomes sampled from around the world. Each dot here represents one virus and the lines between them represent the genetic distance between any two viruses. So the shorter the line, the more closely related the two viruses are, and the longer the line, the more distantly related the two viruses are. The colors represent the variants of concern, like Omicron, Delta, and other Greek letter designations. These are actually designated by the World Health Organization, and you may have heard of these terms in the news. Uh, 
So anytime we sequence a virus and want to determine its relationship to other viruses, typically a phylogenetic tree is created. So you take your samples and the samples that you'd like to compare to or the, the viruses you'd like to compare to, and you build a phylogenetic tree. But this tree building process is a computationally intensive task. Uh, but essentially in the end, you end up with an idea of how your virus is related to other viruses. The downside is this is quite impractical to, impractical to do on a regular basis, especially considering the ocean or tidal wave of data that has been generated since the pa pandemic began in March, 2020. To date, there are over 10 million SARS-CoV-2 genomes and the data associated data that are publicly available. So using all of that data to generate a tree takes a tremendous, a tremendous amount of effort, both computationally and personally. So that brings me to my next slide, uh, a piece of software called Pangolin. So during this pandemic, researchers at the University of Oxford and the University of Edinburgh in the UK developed a piece of software called Pangolin, which provides an easy way to determine the genetic relatedness of one SARS-CoV-2 virus to another. Instead of building a tree for every new virus that we're interested in, Pangolin uses a machine learning algorithm to classify the virus and its mutational pattern in comparison to all other viruses that have been observed or seen so far. The main advantages of this tool is the speed, or one, uh, the decreased computational complexity, and three, the hierarchical nomenclature that is assigned to each virus. So you may have heard of a term like B.1.1.7 in the past. Um, this is actually the pangolin nomenclature that tells us about the history of that particular variant and where it came from originally. The B.1.1.7 uh, variant is also known as the alpha variant. And again, this is a WHO uh, nomenclature. So the Pangolin tool has been incredibly valuable and important when communicating with other scientists around the world. But as you might imagine, with a machine learning algorithm, the model has to be frequently retrained and republished to keep up with the fast paced evolution of the virus. So to keep up with the fast paced evolution of the virus and additionally the fast uh, release cycle of the Pangolin software, Docker has been a lifesaver. Uh, Pangolin has a very short release cycle. They publish new versions about once every two weeks, sometimes once a week. And so to keep up with this, uh, uh, we've been utilizing Docker um, to containerize the software and quickly distribute it. So over the last two years, I've created and ma maintained numerous Docker images that contain the Pangolin software and its dependencies and regularly share the updated images over Slack to anyone across the world who might take advantage of it. So the way that users take advantage of this tool in Docker image and its latest and greatest version is to use analysis workflows that leverage Docker containers, much like the two examples that I gave earlier. So when they go to run their analysis workflows on their SARS-CoV-2 samples, they can use the latest Pangolin Docker image and know that the software is good to go and contains the most up-to-date machine learning model and the databases that are used to assign the SARS-CoV-2 lineages. So this helps keep everyone on the same page and they're all using the same software when doing coronavirus surveillance. So some of the major takeaways from this talk is that containerization solves many problems in bioinformatics and in the field of public health. Uh, firstly, on the distribution of open source software to a variety of compute infrastructures. No matter what computer you're working on, if you can install Docker, you can take advantage of the tools. Um, secondly, repeat, repeat ability or repro reproducibility. Uh, this is a very important uh, topic in science and especially in the public health context. And so we want to make sure that we're able to reproduce the same results and that they are comparable. The results are comparable across different laboratories. It really simple. And thirdly, it really simplifies the development of analysis workflows. So we can essentially abstract away the tool itself and think more about the inputs and outputs of the workflow and less so worrying about 
the uh, random Python dependencies required for a specific tool in a workflow. We don't need to uh, worry about uh, the dependency mess that you can get into with open source software. So essentially we can focus more on the science and less on software dependencies. So Kelsey really emphasized this point and I will do the same here. Infectious disease surveillance is built upon the backs of open source software. Without it, we would not be where we are today uh, uh, without the open source software developed and used by the community. And lastly, containerization has been instrumental throughout the pandemic, allowing a large number of laboratories with varying capabilities and varying expertise to contribute to the global surveillance effort of COVID-19, which has huge impacts and implications on vaccine development, uh, you know, uh, COVID treatment options, and just the overall general tracking and surveillance of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, and acknowledge all those listed here as they have at one point or another contributed to this open source project. I'd like to thank the much larger Staff B group and the hundreds of members involved. I wanna thank the Association of Public Health Labs for their support. Without their support, I never would have started this project back in 2018. And I wanna also acknowledge the SPHERES Consortium um, for their efforts in harmonizing and the US and global COVID-19 surveillance efforts. Um, I wanna thank Aurelian at Docker for helping to organize and coordinate this talk. And lastly, but not certainly not least, I wanna thank Docker for supporting our project and designating our organization as an open source organization on Docker Hub. And with that, I will take any questions that folks may have. Thank you for your time and attention.